like to introduce uh, your host of today, which is uh, our colleague Nakano san, who is now calling in with the last presenter. I'm sorry, I cannot, uh, you cannot see her, but also next to me is uh, uh, Nicole Dirksen. And uh, me, Rob Stokes, I am your moderator of today, and we all work for the embassy in uh, Tokyo. If you have any technical questions uh, according, uh, in uh, connection to this uh, webinar today, you can uh, send a very short email to uh, the address that is uh, written below uh, Nicole's uh, picture. Thank you. And I am Rob Stokes, I am your moderator of today. Uh, we organized this uh, mission together with uh, the Netherlands Enterprise Agency in The Hague. And I would like to shortly give the word to our colleague from The Hague, Alexandra de Vogel. Alexandra? Yes, thank you, Rob. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I work uh, at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency in the International Innovation Team. Uh, together with our colleagues like Rob and Nicole, um, we organize these innovation missions, usually physical, when we travel to Japan or a Japanese delegation travels to the Netherlands, but this time uh, digital. Um, we organize this for public and private parties and research institutes to exchange knowledge and explore opportunities for collaboration. And we really hope you get uh, inspired during these two weeks uh, about uh, about the Netherlands and for the uh, Dutch delegation uh, about Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Today's program, after my short opening, we will have seven presentations from the Netherlands Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy, from the Japanese Ministry of Economic, Economic Trade and Industry, from the Dutch uh, uh, TKI New Gas, the Japanese Ministry of Environment, the city of Groningen, Kawasaki City, and the city of Rotterdam. After the presentations, we will have some time for Q&A, but if you have a question, during the presentations, please use the Q&A function in the WebEx uh, uh, application and ask your question. And please also indicate the presenter to who you want to uh, ask the question to. And after the closing, uh, I expect that we can resume uh, a little bit after 10 o'clock in the Netherlands, uh, which is five o'clock in Japan. First of all, as an opening uh, from the embassy, we uh, promote and stimulate uh, bilateral collaboration in many fields. And in this case, uh, it's of course hydrogen as part of the energy transition. On the top right corner, you can see some pictures of booklets and delegations that we have done uh, until now. This goes back to 2016, but also before that. But these are some, some recent examples of delegations to and from Japan. And these uh, delegations lead to uh, collaboration. And one collaboration is between the governments uh, of Japan and the Netherlands. Here you can see an example uh, of the memorandum of cooperation on hydrogen between uh, the two ministries of the Netherlands and Japan, the economy uh, ministries, which was signed uh, in September 2019 during the second hydrogen energy ministerial meeting organized by Japan. And in this MOC, we, the both countries, both governments, uh, uh, recognize each other to play, play a leading role and both say it's important to uh, innovate and collaborate internationally. The MOC was signed on the Japanese side by Mr. Hirai, who was the Deputy Commissioner of the Agency of Natural Resource and Energy of the Ministry of METI. And on the Dutch side, it was signed by Ms. Noor van Hulst, who was then our hydrogen envoy of the ministry. Collaborations uh, uh, follow such uh, de delegations, as I said. And at this moment, I can uh, inform you that we are preparing from the Netherlands a, a multi-annual public-private program on hydrogen to, to um, further develop the relations uh, with Japan. PRB stands for Partners for International Business, which is a government uh, uh, program. 
for three years and we are preparing to start in 2021 until 2023 and the purpose to build relations between governments, businesses and knowledge institutes. And this is so a coming together of uh, Dutch government and companies. And the activities are missions, expos, exhibitions, and of course next year there will be a special uh, event. Of this is the, the Olympics here in Tokyo, and we will see how we can connect to that within this program. And uh, also uh, an example of what we do is at this moment, uh, our webinar is part of uh, the hydrogen mission that we are organizing between, uh, for last year, last week and this week. There are three tracks, policy, supply chain and smart cities. It's organized by our embassy in Tokyo, Netherlands and Enterprise Agency and the Enterprise Europe Network. It's still, we're still not finished. We're, this week we have quite some programs. So if you're interested, uh, below is the link and you can also, uh, uh, you can still register through this link. The mission is built around the hem that I uh, explained before and it was mentioned before as well by uh, Alexandra. And uh, I think that some, and I hope actually many of you attended the video conference or the, the virtual conf the, the session last uh, week, October 14th, which was the third uh, HEM organized by the Japanese government. And I just share some takeaways. The first one uh, is that the IEA, uh, the International Energy Agency, uh, Executive Director Mr. Fatih Birol announced three new items, three news items. One, IEA will closely work together with Japan on hydrogen. The second one, IEA will publish annual reports on hydrogen activities. And the third, uh, the IEA announced Ms. Van Oren Hulst, who was the signer of the MOC that I just mentioned, as its new hydrogen advisor. So here we can already see that Japan and the Netherlands are, are, are mentioned and put on the, uh, on the podium internationally, and that is very encouraging uh, and it's in line, I think, with uh, what we written, what we wrote down in the MOC last year. Also, there was a video message by Mr. Minister Eric Wiebes, our Dutch Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. And uh, he basically uh, mentioned that the Netherlands is stimulating investments in innovation in hydrogen and also put the Netherlands on the map as a hydrogen hub and an important country in terms of the EU backbone for energy systems, for infrastructures. During the three uh, industrial sessions of the HEM, there were uh, two in, uh, Netherlands industrial presentations by Shell and Staden. And there were many uh, Japanese industrial presentations as well, including Toshiba, Panasonic, Mitsubishi Power and Kawasaki Heavy. And I name all these companies specifically because uh, during uh, our mission, all these companies have been um, uh, involved in webinars that we did last week. And uh, so we are really proud that uh, all those companies that spoke during the HEM are also here with us uh, this week. And indeed, last week we had uh, two uh, uh, webinars. On Thursday, we had supply chain webinars with uh, Vattenfall, Mitsubishi, Gasuni, Kawasaki, Heavy, and uh, Dutch company Volpark. And on Friday, we had a webinar Smart Cities with companies Stadium, Panasonic, City of Hoogeveen, Toshiba, and Kiva. And this week, we will have, after today's uh, webinar, two more uh, events on uh, Tuesday. That's tomorrow. We will have a, a virtual session with virtual network tables where different organizations have a table and you can join in. This is an open session. And on Wednesday and Thursday, there will be a closed business matchmaking event organized together with the European uh, network uh, organization. And of course, we hope these all lead to collaboration. This is all our, uh, our purpose. Having said that, I would uh, like to, to continue to our first speaker, uh, which is from the Netherlands Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. And our speaker is Mr. Han Veenstra, who is a hydrogen program leader in the ministry. Uh, Han Veenstra, please, the, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rob. And Good afternoon, everybody in Japan, and good morning, everybody in the Netherlands. It's my pleasure to address you today at this uh, webinar. Um, yeah, my name is Han Veenstra. I'm indeed the uh, hydrogen program 
uh, leader at the ministry. And um, we are working on hydrogen policy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> hydrogen policy in the Netherlands is, um, is part actually of our climate policy. Uh, and it's not a standalone policy. Uh, two years ago, we concluded in the Netherlands the climate agreement. And you can see some of the highlights on this uh, slide. And as you can see, hydrogen was an important chapter in this climate agreement. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> agreed on the number of ambitions. Uh, and the most ambitious one was the, the three to four gigawatt electrolyzed capacity that we hope to reach by 2030 or probably maybe even earlier. Um, next slide, please. But in order to uh, make this happen, uh, we had to be more clear on what kind of strategy this would uh, entail. And that's why earlier this year, uh, we published the National Hydrogen Strategy, which is more focusing on the role of the government. And the, um, an important part of this strategy was actually to recognize that uh, hydrogen is actually the missing link is indispensable to reach a zero carbon energy supply. And in that respect, it's, it's really a responsibility uh, from our government to make sure that other policies to make this happen will be in, in place. And of course, this is helped by the fact that the Netherlands has a very good starting position for hydrogen uh, because of our gas grid, of our offshore wind potential, of the, the industry, of the big ports, of our knowledge uh, about gas. And of course, it was also helped by the fact that there were a huge number of companies and regions that wanted to work with hydrogen. And there was a lot of demand versus, uh, uh, um, uh, well, many stakeholders were actually really uh, pushing the government also to come up with uh, funding and regulations. And we also acknowledged that this was not only for the energy transition, but at the, the focus on hydrogen was also really an economic opportunity. Um, this hydrogen strategy was both national and international because we recognized from the start that if we want this to succeed, uh, if we really want to establish a hydrogen a value chain, then uh, you, one needs to have an international market. So that's why from the start on, uh, we had our energy envoy and we worked um, on international partnerships. Um, to make clear about, uh, to make clear what the government would do, we also issued a policy agenda with four uh, pillars. Please, next slide. And here you can see what we saw as the, as the role of the government or what we see as the role of the government. Um, I will focus on a number of uh, really important issues. One is the, um, uh, what of course is quite special about the Netherlands, we have a very extensive uh, gas grid, uh, one of the most uh, extensive gas grids in, in the world. And we are planning to repurpose, to reuse part of this gas grid for hydrogen. So currently we are uh, uh, doing very extensive research together with uh, our TSO, Hassini, on what is needed to make this happen, uh, safety-wise, uh, technical issues, um, what is the market, um, what, uh, is the, what kind of volumes can be expected. Uh, um, and of course, we also look, because at the, at the moment, there is not yet really a market for clean hydrogen. But once there is a, mask, uh, a market, and, uh, and because we recognize that there will be a, a broad demand for clean hydrogen, uh, market regulation will be needed. So this is also one of our focus areas. And uh, this, we of course, we are doing within the context of EU energy policy, uh, because the Netherlands is uh, not alone uh, um, with its focus on hydrogen. All the countries in Northwestern Europe are currently uh, very ambitious when it comes to hydrogen. Um, another interesting aspect of the Netherlands, I think, is the potential to link 
uh, the production of hydrogen to offshore wind energy. So uh, we, currently we are also researching on whether there can, we can make some smart combinations, for example, through tenders uh, for offshore wind farms that also include uh, uh, the production of hydrogen. And actually this is already supported by, uh, um, by companies that are asking for this. So there's really uh, uh, a market potential for this. Um, and as I said, we, uh, we make international uh, policy uh, uh, a part of our strategy. And in particular with our neighboring countries, uh, we are working hard on, a, on an aligned approach to develop this market. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, we have uh, quite a few drivers uh, to, 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 to stimulate this market, but I think two really stand out. And one is the, the fact that the Netherlands is already a huge uh, producer and user of, of industrial hydrogen, as you can see on this on the on the left side of the of the slide. Uh, after Germany, we are the largest producer of hydrogen. Now, basically, uh, uh, producing it from natural gas. So this existing market can be a, a good basis to uh, build up the clean hydrogen market. Uh, as I just mentioned. This offshore wind potential also offers a lot of opportunities because we can produce our own green hydrogen. And uh, what we actually see is that um, um, with hydrogen, we can even maybe even uh, um, um, speed up the development of offshore wind. Yeah? Because what we see is that. Uh, to improve the business case for, for offshore wind farms, it will be necessary to bring in other demand. And uh, hydrogen as an energy carrier can reach other markets. And uh, so hopefully through the combination of offshore wind and uh, hydrogen production, we can speed up the uh, integration of re renewable uh, energy in our energy system. Next slide, please. Um, in the Netherlands, um, currently we already have more than 100 announcements of projects, hydrogen projects, ranging from small to extremely big projects. Um, this is a map uh, from our TSO Gasuni, and on this map you actually can also see the outline of this hydrogen backbone and how it's linking the industrial clusters and it also singles out a number of projects. Why I want to show you this map is because it also shows clearly the international context of our hydrogen strategy. As you can see, the backbone is also reaching out to Belgium, to Germany. And uh, it's also indicating that in the future we will import hydrogen. And um, uh, so we clearly see hydrogen in a very in an international context. And that's also why, as mentioned already by uh, Mr. Rob Strux, we are very happy to have this partnership with uh, Japan uh, because we think that if we want hydrogen to succeed, uh, uh, we not only need to work together on this topic in, in, in Europe, but we need to work together on a, on a global level. And we need to have this global framework to set up uh, uh, to reach, to come to an uh, international market for hydrogen. And we believe that uh, we see that Japan is playing a very important role there. And we, uh, recognized its global leadership by, by Japan. And uh, we want to reach out and, and make sure that both in Europe and in Asia, we can work on this, uh, on, on this global market for hydrogen. So um, I'm very happy that uh, this event is being organized and uh, I'm sure it will uh, contribute to our uh, partnership. And um, well, I very much look forward also to the presentations from our colleagues from uh, Japan. Thank you. Yes, uh, Han, thank you very much for uh, your good presentation and very informative and giving the latest standpoints and uh, the overviews. And 
as I said in the beginning, the Q&A story will do in the end. So uh, if you allow me, I will continue now to the next uh, presenter, which is the Japanese uh, from the Japanese Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry. And our presenter is Mr. Ryosuke Fuji Oka, who is the Deputy Director of Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Strategy Office within the Ministry of, uh, of, of Japan. Mr. Fujioka, the, the virtual floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Ryosuke Fujioka. I'm working at METI, and, which is, and I'm responsible for some of the hydrogen policy in Japan. And so I would like to make a brief presentation about Japan's vision and actions towards hydrogen-based economy. Um, can you move to the next slide? Um, can you move to the next slide, please? Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, firstly, I would like to introduce um, the hydrogen industrial uh, energy ministerial meeting, which uh, was held uh, last week, um, at, although Bob-san has already um, summarized it very well, um, but uh, with increased momentum around hydrogens, um, about uh, 2.8 thousand people um, came and um, saw the event online, um, and that'll be, so I believe that it was a great success, and I would like to say um, thank you um, to His Excellency, uh, Minister Weebes Eric, um, to make a great speech on behalf of um, Netherlands. So um, it is really useful, I think, for both countries to take an initiatives on increasing momentum um, around the hydrogens together um, in the multinational fora. And we would like to keep on um, hosting the hydrogen energy ministerial um, in Japan um, from um, next year as well. Um, please move on to the next page. So I would like to um, talk a little bit about what uh, Japanese government is doing to attain hydrogen society. Um, I would like to focus on the basic hydrogen strategy, uh, which uh, was created uh, with uh, then Prime Minister Abe's initiatives. And um, we, our hydrogen strategy has a two characteristic. Uh, first one, um, this one is the oldest um, comprehensive uh, national strategy in the world. And uh, the second one is we are we have a detailed strategy with numerical targets, especially on cost. So we would like to uh, decrease the cost uh, of the hydrogen as low as LNG in the long term. So that means two dollars per kilograms by 2050. Um, please move on to the next page. Thank you. Um, to attain that uh, very challenging cost. Uh, target, we are doing three things uh, written in the middle. Uh, from the supply side, we are trying to use the inexpensive feedstock, such as unused resources and uh, some of the renewables. So, uh, in other words, we are indifferent from the resource, whether it is coming from the hydrocarbons or renewables, uh, like uh, the Netherlands. And the second thing, so we are trying to develop some of the infrastructure. Um, so, to um, trans um, to uh, trans sorry transport uh, some of the hydrogens overseas from uh, from overseas to Japan, and uh, I would like to talk the detail for a little bit later. And for the demand side, uh, we are trying to use it on a massive scale. And first, we are getting on the footfall from the mobility, and then move on to the power generation, and then we are trying to deploy some of the hydrogen to the industry in the long run. Uh, please move on to the next slide. Thank you. And we uh, put in a lot of numerical targets towards hydrogen society, and there, this is it. And we put emphasis on the generation and mobility on the demand side, and, um, you, and we have a specific target about cost and volume. Um, it seems weird at the first glance that our volume of around 2030 is low, but um, this is a little bit misleading. So I'll like to um, add a couple of couple of words. Um, so this is only focusing on the new sector, and uh, we already used about around uh, two million ton of the hydrogens in the industrial sector, like Netherlands, uh, such as in the refinery and the ammonia production. So this is a kind of um, underestimating our uh, demand. Um, 
please move on to the next slide. So uh, in addition to the hydrogen um, strategy, we also developed a strategic roadmap for hydrogen and fuel cells um, to discuss um, about how to achieve goals in the strategy with a set of technical milestones and a set of policy actions. So we are breaking down some of the um, goals with a specific KPI. Uh, so let me introduce some of them. So the first one is around about the price difference between uh, fossil fuel, fossil cell, uh, uh, FCV and a uh, uh, hybrid vehicle. So uh, we are trying to narrow uh, the gap between those two different types of the um, cars to uh, make FCB as economic as possible. So these kind of things we are trying to um, make our goals very concrete. Uh, please move on to the next slide. Thank you. So I would like to introduce about the recent progress in Japan, uh, mainly focusing on by mainly focusing on uh, uh, some of the things um, shown in the red frame. Um, first one is about uh, Mirai, uh, Toyota's activity. So um, Toyota uh, will make their, um, Toyota is um, um, producing the Mirai from 2014, but they are trying to um, have a next model of Mirai um, at, from this, the end of this year. And this, according to them, so they are trying to uh, make their production capacity tenfold um, to 30. Uh, thousand cars per year. And in addition to the um, passenger vehicles, they are trying to getting the footfall into the commercial vehicles such as FC truck. So they are now collaborating with Hino, Hino Motors um, to develop um, some of the FC truck um, in the uh, middle term. So and heavy duty vehicle is um, everybody is now uh, paying attention to the heavy duty vehicles because this place is the place which the hydrogen can play a bigger role. Uh, compare with other um, decarbonized technology. And the other thing is that so we are uh, also putting emphasis on the renewables and renewable uh, hydrogen. And uh, despite um, the devastating coronavirus, we are thankfully um, open. Um, FH Sual are located in Fukushima, uh, which have a 10 megawatt electrolyzer. Um, which is uh, the biggest electrolyzer in the world, uh, one of the biggest electrolyzer in the world from uh, March. And now we are doing some of the demonstrations uh, in there and uh, we are still uh, hoping to use some of the hydrogens uh, created from FH2L uh, to the Olympic game as a uh, flame of the torch. And please move on to the next slide. And we um, have a lot of um, movement uh, as well in the establishing international hydrogen supply chain arena and we are doing the two demonstration projects uh, between Japan and Australia and Japan and Brunei. So let me introduce about the Japan and the Australia first. Um, so from this Australian project, uh, Japan Australia project, so we are trying to carry some of the liquefied hydrogens uh, from Australia to Japan and the uh, ship is almost done and it was um, launched in December 20. Uh, last year, and then we are trying to dispatch um, this carrier ship um, to Australia, uh, maybe early in 2021. And uh, I'm really appreciative to Shell um, because they are uh, the operators of this um, carrier ship, which uh, the Japanese uh, company is not familiar with about how to operate. And uh, the second one is the Brunei project. So this one is uh, used uh, turbine, turbine, some of the chemical products as a carrier to transport hydrogen. And um, this one, uh, we already um, start operating and the dehydrogeneration plant in Japan completed in uh, this um, last May. And then uh, we um, already accepted some of the um, MCH, which, compri which is comprised of the turbine and hydrogen. Um, the next slide, please. And the recent progress outside of Japan, uh, I would like to make a brief word about uh, generation. So uh, as you may know, uh, the first contract of the Mitsubishi powers of um, this um, tr the turbine, which is dedicated to the hydrogens, 
is uh, with uh, Netherlands, but they are expanding their business very rapidly. Um, this example is about uh, uh, their business in Utah states and um, America. So California is now uh, pushing forward. The California government is uh, going forward uh, very rapidly towards a decarbonized world, but they need some of the inertia in the grid system. So they are expecting um, the hydrogen generation system can play a bigger role in this arena. So um, I'm, the generation side is in the Utah states, but um, the Mitsubishi powers um, generators is used for um, providing some of the electricity and uh, ancillary service to the California. So we are, I think uh, there's um, this area where we can um, collaborate with each other as well. So um, let me um, add uh, one more things about uh, uh, our future of the policy. So we, as you may know, um, the Japanese government started considering uh, the revising the basic energy plan um, from last week. And uh, the basic energy plan is the most important uh, plan for deciding the energy policy in Japan. And um, so I think we will um, make a discussions about hydrogen as well and how we can position that hydrogen in the decarbonized world uh, in a much uh, with some of the updated from the past. So we might uh, change uh, some of the strategy based on those upcoming division uh, discussion. And uh, we are in Netherlands is always uh, our partner to um, attain the hydrogen energy, hydrogen society. So we are expecting uh, to facilitate the collaboration, not only among the government level, but also among the private sectors level. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, this is all of my presentation. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Fujioka-san, for a very informative and uh, latest updates. It was really good to see your long-term uh, perspectives and also your short-term uh, strategies that you just uh, renewed a few days ago. So this, uh, this is very in, uh, informative and very inspiring. Um, now I'd like to continue to the next speaker from the TKI New Gas. And our speaker is uh, Mr. Jor Giefler, who is the director of uh, TKI New Gas and the Dutch Top Sector Energy. Uh, Jor, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to address our friends in Japan. So good afternoon to you. And of course, our friends in the Netherlands. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will be briefly talking about mainly innovation and projects, and I will touch on uh, policy. So next slide, please. Um, yes, you can skip this one as well. So, um, and part of this has already been uh, um, stressed by Han Veenstra, is that we have some important milestones in the Netherlands for hydrogen, and not only in the Netherlands, but we have our climate agreement that he uh, explained and in January, we uh, released our innovation roadmap in which we described what kind of innovation is necessary to make um, hydrogen a success. And later in my presentation, I will give you a link to our innovation roadmap. And of course, in March, the government presented their uh, hydrogen strategy. So in general, we have a climate agreement, we have a government strategy, and we have an innovation roadmap. And, and I think that that is an excellent start uh, for hydrogen, and not only for the Netherlands, but our ambitions and our plans have actually been um, uh, backed by a very strong European announcement on hydrogen, which is not only a green deal and a recovery plan, but we also have a hydro hydrogen strategy, which is very, very ambitious on a European level, connecting all the European members into one great strategy. So next slide, please. And um, I think this, ha this has also been elaborated a little bit. Like if you look at the Netherlands, the red uh, uh, spot here on this little map is um, we have a lot um, uh, to offer. Um, and that's the reason why we would like to invest in hydrogen. Of course, our excellent infrastructure has already been mentioned the high demand in our industry clusters, 
that's very important and towards 2050 has to be decarbonized. Of course, we have our huge potential for offshore wind and not to forget, uh, as far as innovation is concerned, we have an excellent knowledge infrastructure with universities, research institute and consultants. And we have a lot of companies that deal with hydrogen. Like last year, we had an inventory and we counted nearly 300 companies dealing with hydrogen. So our starting point is very, very good. Next slide, please. So uh, first of all, I would like to talk just very briefly about our government strategy. Please, uh, next one. And um, I think that this has been said already by Han Feinstein, and maybe just to pick out a few ones. Um, what's very important in the, in the government strategy on hydrogen is that we recognize the, the systemic role of hydrogen. So hydrogen is not only necessary for full decarbonization, but it also plays a very important systemic role, coupling several sectors on each other. And maybe the second one I would like to mention is it's not only about green hydrogen. Yes, green hydrogen is very important, but we also have to look at blue hydrogen. So let's say um, natural gas-based hydrogen combined with CCS, carbon capture and storage, because the demand for climate neutral hydrogen is so large that we have to keep all options open. And the last point I would like to stress is no country can do this on our own. So that's why we're so happy with our MOC with uh, Japan. International collaboration is key for successful development and deployment of hydrogen. Next slide, please. And here I just summarized um, all the uh, uh, aspects and elements of the government strategy so we can skip this one. That's been said already. Um, now I would like to skip to the hydrogen innovation roadmap which are stepping stones to make hydrogen part of our daily life. Next slide, please. Um, just how, how did we get here? In 2018, we um, published a report um, describing what hydrogen could mean for the energy transition. And every time when I present this, it's, um, it's remarkable how fast all our all our insights have changed like we're making so big progress steps with hydrogen that the landscape sort of seems to be changing every three months or so so it's really amazing the speed at which hydrogen develops and um, our most recent report is the hydrogen roadmap for innovation so i would like to skip to the next slide and um our hydrogen innovation strategy consists of uh, five different topics. The first one is that we have said we have to go from only vision making to policy making, and that is exactly what uh, has happened. So maybe you can give it one click. See if this works. Yeah, perfect. Um, so that's in place. The second one, and maybe another click, is that we think that part of our innovation is that we have to realize demonstration projects because only in real life practical projects, we can learn what the full potential is of hydrogen. So we have to bring it into practice. The third one is that we have cre uh, to create the required conditions. So please one more click, um, which means that we have to make sure that also the legislation is there, that the infrastructure is being developed, that we know how to deal with safety standards and with quality issues. That's also, very important to be able to demonstrate hydrogen in its full potential. The fourth one, please another click, um, is that we do not only need to focus on the short term, what we can do with hydrogen now, but we also have to deal with the longer term, 2030 to 2050, and have to make sure that all the innovations that we need in the future are there. One example is the production of synthetic fuels, which is um, a very promising field, but still we have to learn a lot and we have to investigate a lot before we can really develop it to its full potential. And the last one is, one click again, please, is um, yeah that we need um, supporting actions, like we have to make sure that our workforce is there, that we educate people, that we have training programs, 
and not in the last crisis. We have to make sure that society accepts these developments, so we have to communicate continuously. So the next slide, please. Um, as last part of my presentation, I would like to mention some hydrogen projects, and we have made an inventory, which I will uh, I give you also a link to, with 99 projects that are being developed in the Netherlands. And I would like just like to give you three examples of those projects because uh, my time is limited. So next slide, please. Um, I think that this is going to be one of the biggest, maybe the biggest uh, project in the world as far as electrolyzer capacity is concerned. Let's say the new generation of electrolyzers using green electricity, which is a 20 megawatt uh, plant in the Northern Netherlands with a big consortium of parties. Um, financial investment decision is expected next uh, this year. And the hydrogen is meant to be used uh, for the production of biomethanol, so biomass together with hydrogen producing biomethanol to make that huge market uh, by uh, methanol is the I think the, the commodity that has the biggest market share in the world as far as export and import is concerned. So this is really an important project. Next slide, please. The, the other project, and maybe our friends from the Northern Netherlands will tell more about this, is it's a so-called heaven project. And this uh, the area, the Northern Netherlands, was chosen as the hydrogen demonstration area by the European Commission last year. And it started at uh, the beginning of this year. It's a huge integrated project with many, many partners, different sub-projects in it, in industry, mobility, built environment, and also showing the flexibility that hydrogen can offer, for example, to um, to have an interface between production and use. Storage is included. So this is really a world-class project that we are very, very proud of. And I would like to see the next slide, please. The third project I would like to uh, uh, talk to you about is the high stock project, which maybe has been elaborated on uh, last week already by Gasuni. But this is starting with a one megawatt uh, electrolyzer installation, testing um, the storage of hydrogen in the salt cavern. This is also a world-class project, and I heard that there will be um, um, an extension of this project soon. So um, they are planning actually in 2026 to have a large-scale hydrogen storage operational, um, let's say one salt cavern that can be um, filled with hydrogen completely to make sure that we have the, the right flexibility in our um, future hydrogen system to accommodate between production and consumption. So we'd like to move to the last slide. So um, just to conclude, um, we see that the Dutch government has made the homework. So we're very happy that they come up with a strategy which will help us, knowledge institutes and, in and industry, to take the next step with hydrogen. And that strategy is also supported by Europe, which is very important as we collaborate, collaborate a lot within Europe. Um, we also have an innovation strategy that has full support of the European Commission. And we have many, many projects ready for demonstration and implementation. So we would really like to go from paper to project. And I would like to stress again that um, to explore the full potential and to demonstrate the full potential of hydrogen, it, it will take a huge international effort. And that's why I was so glad to be talking to our Japanese friends and to see where we can collaborate and make hydrogen a success and a contribution to our energy transition and our 2050 climate goals. So I would like to skip to my last slide, which is just for your information. I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you would like to look at the documents that I mentioned in my presentation, you can find the links here. So thank you very much again for your uh, interest in my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Jorg. Uh, very, uh, yeah, I th I, I, as I, I wrote down, uh, you put a lot of energy in this transition. So it is really uh, it's, it's a metaphor, but it's also really true. And uh, thank you for all your, your intention and, and, and updates. updates. 
Um, I would like to go on to the uh, next speaker from the Japanese Ministry of the Environment. Our speaker is Mr. Naoto Otani, who is the Chief of Hydrogen in the Climate Change Projects Office within the Ministry of Environment of Japan. Mr. Otani, the virtual floor is yours. Yes, I'm talking. Hello uh, for Netherlands. Good morning. My name is Naoto Otani from, I'm, uh, from Japan. But I'm sorry, I, I will talk with the mask on. Uh, I'm in charge of hydrogen at the Ministry of the Environment, Japan. Thank you for giving us your precious time for the presentation today. I would like to talk about hydrogen in Egypt by the Ministry of the Environment. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, <laughs> The G20 was held in Japan in June 2019 in the G20 Carrizo Innovation Action Plan on Energy Transition and Global Environment for Sustainable Growth, compiled at the Minister of the Environment meeting held in Carrizo. Further promotion of hydrogen through international cooperation and from the perspective of the long-term storage hydrogen can play a major role in the green energy future. Next, please. Thank you. The country in various parts of Japan, local governments have this declared to effectively eliminate carbon dioxide and emirates by 2050. There are 1058 local governments, and these local governments represent 73 million people, which is 57.8 percentage of Japanese population. Next, please. And the Ministry of the Environment is developing business that will lead to the expansion of domestic renewable energy in the introduction and regionally revitalization using the demand for hydrogen and the renewable energy resources of the region. We are trying to lead to an autonomous, decentralized society and revitalization of the region. Next, please. Thank you. The Ministry of the Environment has been working on technology development related to renewable energy hydrogen since 2015. We are conducting demonstration projects in eight regions of Japan so that hydrogen can be product, produced, transported, and used locally. We are implementing projects with different co contents in three locations in Hokkaido, Miyagi Prefecture, Akita Prefecture, Yokohama City, and Kawasaki City, and Yamaguchi Prefecture. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a project in Shikawa Town, Hokkaido. Gary is serving in Shikawa Town. Hydrogen is extracted as biogas from these livestock mushroom. This area can reach minus 20 degrees Celsius in winter, but this is an example of using this hydrogen to grow tangas in warm water, using a fuel cell to make caviar and connect it to local resources. Next, please. Also, in Yokohama City, instead of fueling to as a hydrogen station, this simple hydrogen fueling vehicle will be used directly to fill the fuel cell forklift of the beer factories, etc., etc., which are local here in the 
distribution warehouse the others uh, in Tomia City near the prefecture we are developing a project to transfer hydrogen as a storage alloy together with a distribution network of supermarkets we recognize that the Ministry of the Environment is now required to implement these project that we have implemented so far, of course, both only Japan and internationally. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, uh, we have been interviewed by overseas media about these demonstrations and they are disseminating them in our own country. This is just an example. The Shikawicho project I mentioned earlier was interviewed by Sky TV in the United Kingdom. TBS TV in Japan converted the project in Kawasaki City. All of them have been featured on TV programs and widely disseminated to everyone. And I think this is a good opportunity to expand hydrogen initiatives. If the your side wishes to do these interviews, we will make an adjustment, so please let us know. I promise to welcome you very much. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Otani-san. Uh, you could clearly see that you are very active and the, re the relation between national and local government is really important. And this is also a bridge to our next three uh, presenters, which are indeed uh, not from national, but from uh, local and from municipal, municipal level. And uh, the first of those three presenters, presentations, the first one will be from the city of Groningen. And our presenter today, thank you very much for joining here, Mr. Paul de Rook, who is uh, the vice mayor of the city of Groningen. Mr. de Rook, I give the virtual floor to you. To you. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, good afternoon to our Japanese friends and good morning to our uh, Dutch colleagues. Um, as I said on the first slide, uh, my name is Paul de Rook. I'm the vice mayor of the city of Groningen. And I'm truly honored to have been given the opportunity to tell you something about ourselves and our ambitions towards hydrogen uh, uh, economies in the future. And I would like to invite you to play a part in uh, realizing them. Uh, next slide, please. So what you need to know about the city of Groningen is that we're a city of uh, around 230,000 inhabitants. We're the capital of the province of Groningen. Uh, half of our residents are uh, under the age of 35, and uh, therefore we are one of the youngest cities in Europe. We're an international university town with a university which is in the global top 100. Um, it has an atmosphere of a young, vibrant, creative and innovative and multicultural city. Uh, it's internationally renowned with its cultural offering, and we also have great nightlife. At least it was before COVID-19, of course. We have a healthy startup culture, uh, lots of talent. We love innovative companies, especially in the areas of uh, the digital economy, health, uh, and the energy sector. And you also need to know that Groningen is on top of one of the largest natural gas fields of Europe. And that mining of natural gas starting in the 1950s that has uh, brought decades of prosperity to the Netherlands. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the thriving gas mining and energy sector uh, and downstream economic activity we have it has provided us with expertise and also knowledge of anything pertaining to natural gas and energy uh, but it also has brought uh, earthquakes to the region uh, damaging homes in the province of Groningen and uh, we have now registered over 1 million damages uh, in houses already so that meant that there was a large pop popular voice in this region that said we need really need to change the way that we obtain and use our energy. Next slide, please.
So Groningen decided very early on to embrace CO2 neutrality um, and emission reduction and to join the development of a regional hydrogen economy to replace, in effect, on the long term, the national gas economy that was here. So it is, you could say, it's a strategy with a European vision, but also focuses on local impact. And I would like to tell you something about that. The Groningen region both have a strategy for playing a key role in the European energy supply in the future. Also, creating on the short term tangible evidence on a personal level that hydrogen is here, it's real, and it functions. So on a strategy level, and this is very closely linked to what Han has told you in his presentation from the Ministry of Economic Affairs, uh, we are working with public and private partners to establish the North Sea as a key offshore wind facility when using the capacity of Groningen seaports to transport that wind energy, electrolyzing it, and then transporting it via the hydrogen backbone in former national gas pipes to, for instance, Germany and Belgium. Uh, Jörg, uh, uh, Mr. Giggler has also uh, told you that uh, uh, Groningen, as part of the Northern Netherlands, has been awarded uh, the Heaven status, which is uh, the European Hydrogen Valley, uh, a comprehensive and holistic agenda for pushing the hydrogen economy uh, even further. Um, but also, and this is also part of the Heaven agenda, uh, we have invested very focused on uh, hands-on, more operational level, so that people can see that hydrogen is not something that is of the future, but that it's here now and it works and that it's very real. So we have invested in making sure we have a, a, a electrolyzer fueling uh, our ever-expanding fleet of cars, but also street sweepers. And so the streets of Groningen are being sweeped by a hydrogen-driven truck. Also garbage trucks are driven by hydrogen right now. We have one of the largest hydrogen bus fleets of Europe with uh, uh, right now operating uh, 25, around 25 buses by the end of this year. We use hydrogen for heating municipal buildings already, and we have plans to further implement and integrate hydrogen applications and infrastructure. These and other hydrogen initiatives that take place in the city have the effect that Groningen is widely known in Europe and elsewhere as being one of the forefront regions of hydrogen development. Also, our inhabitants are already very hydrogen savvy, you could say. Uh, they see what hydrogen economy looks like on the ground when, for instance, a fuel cell garbage trucks collects their waste on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. Uh, Groningen also decided to help drive the development of hydrogen economy uh, by exploiting a unique set of assets that are available to us. We can continue to play a major role in the energy provision of North and West Europe. To strengthen, strengthen our Energy knowledge base and to attract talent and innovative companies from all over the world. So we are really focusing on attracting hydrogen related business as well. One recent example of this is the joint venture uh, Heisen Motors of Europe together with Groningen based Holthausen Group um, to release the hydrogen plant for making hydrogen trucks um, uh, in the region of Groningen. Uh, uh, and they're planning to build 2,000 fuel cell trucks per year. Next slide, please. So here I would like to address to you that even though uh, we from the Netherlands are working on this side of the world and uh, uh, our Japanese friends are working on their side of the world, we do have a common interest when it comes to hydrogen because we as you have a vested interest in, in global acceptance of hydrogen as a sustainable alternative to fossil fuels and feedstock. And only a massive scale-up and energy system integration will drive prices down and will make for a viable and also a competitive hydrogen marketplace. And therefore, we believe that international cooperation is of the essence, both in terms of our neighbors here in Europe and in other parts of the world, like Japan and also Korea, that are at the forefront of the hydrogen revolution. Global acceptance of hydrogen will rely in large part on social acceptance, ensuring our citizens the benefit that hydrogen can play in their daily life and in the sustainable energy mix of the future is crucial. And this is where cities can play a big role. Next slide, please. So thank you for your attention, and we certainly hope to see you again, maybe in Groningen and maybe in Japan. Thank you.
thank you very much, Paul, for um, insight presentation about your activities in your city, but I would say in your region, because you represent a larger area than only the city. So uh, thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Um, I could, uh, could please allow me to continue to the next speaker, which is from Kawasaki City. Can you hear me? And our speaker is Mr. Tetsuya Majima, who is the Coastal Area Business Promotion Division from the city. Mr. Majima, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tetsuya Majima, manager of hydrogen section of Kawasaki City. I'm pleased to have the opportunity of making this presentation. Today, I'll show you about the Kawasaki hydrogen strategy. Next slide, please. First, first, I'll give you an overview of Kawasaki City. Kawasaki City has convenient transportation in the Tokyo metropolitan area and the superior location next to both Tokyo and Yokohama. Kawasaki population is approximately 1,440,000 people. It is one of the few cities where population growth country uh, continues while the population of Japan is as a while is decreasing. Next slide, please. Kawasaki City and the surrounding, surrounding areas have a heavily populated with companies that have technologies related to hydrogen and fuel cell. For example, Toshiba Energy Systems, Asahi Kase, Enos, and the others are located around the Kawasaki coastal area. Next slide, please. Here is a list of eight of the leading projects currently in the Kawasaki City. Among these, I will explain the tactical ones. Next slide, please. A little before ago, Retip explained the results. First is the hydrogen supply chain construction model to be tackled in cooperation with companies such as the Corporation in the Advanced Hydrogen Energy Chain Association for Technology Development, for short we call AHEAD. This project has been implemented in response to the financial support from the METI. Looking ahead to the future, we are promoting the creation of an international supply chain that closely follows hydrogen production, storage, transport, and use. The demonstration was started from May to December 2020, and in one year, a maximum of 210 tons of hydrogen will be delivered. Hydrogen produced in the nation, nation of Brunei is converted into the methylcyclohexane via the organic chemical hydro, hydride method and transported by sea at a standard temperature and pressure. It's a Toa oil company. Toa oil company is a refinery company affiliated to Idemit Corporation in Kawasaki coastal area. Combat is back to hydrogen via the hydrogen generation and use it for power generation. Next slide, please. The second project is a CO2 free hydrogen utilization model at the railway station in cooperation with the e East Japan Railway Company. In January 2015, we concluded a comprehensive cooperation agreement with the East Japan Railway Company, and we are promoting various initiatives. In April 2017, this company, for the first time as a railway operator, introduced CO2 free hydrogen. Electricity generated from hydrogen is used for writing station and mist shower. It generated from hydrogen is used for the heated bench. Next slide, please. Next project is the local, local production for local consumption of hydrogen through regional recycling model. A little further, environment environment explained. 
in cooperation with the Showa Denko Corporation. This project has been implemented in response to the financial support from the Ministry of the Environment. Showa Denko has facilities production, producing hydrogen from used plastic generated in the surrounding areas, increasing, increasing capacity, and transport the hydrogen to the hotel located about five kilometers away from this factory by pipeline. It is used for power generation and heat energy of hotels. This makes it possible to supply hydrogen which covers approximately 30% of the electricity and the heating energy used throughout the entire hotel. So this hydrogen is transported by pipeline across a distance of approximately five kilometers. It starts from 2018. Kawasaki coastal area is the only one area in Japan that hydrogen pipeline is already built under the public road and always used for refinery, chemical industry, and others. Next slide, please. This project is the hydrogen train product practical model in collaborated with Japan Railway East Company. This model is to develop the terrain of the hybrid using hydrogen and perform a test run by 2021. Pressure of hydrogen tank will be 35 megapascals and 70 megapascals. will be filled at the Showa Denko Corporation with hydrogen from the used plastic. Next slide, please. In addition, because there is an ex existing infrastructure such as the hydrogen pipeline owned by various companies, Kawasaki City is consider considering the construction of a wide area hydrogen network as a pilot system. By accumulating such efforts, we intend to expand the use of hydrogen and lead to the realization of the hydrogen society. Next slide, please. If, if you have something question, please contact to me. Thank you for your uh, thank you very much for your attention. Next slide, please. Thank, thank you, you much, Masan, and uh, nice to see you again uh, virtually, and also see the projects and and your uh, continued operations uh, in this field. Thank you so much. I continue, if you allow me, Majima-san, to the next speaker from the city of Rotterdam. And our speaker is Mr. Lieve Brouwer, who is the energy, sorry, advisor energy transition of the city of Rotterdam. Mr. Brouwer, the virtual floor is yours. Very much, Rob. Um, so good morning to everyone in the Netherlands, and of course, uh, good evening to everyone uh, calling in from Japan. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'll be, uh, yeah, uh, detailing some of the developments in uh, in the in the city and the wider area of Rotterdam to you all. So, yeah, looking forward to uh, to sharing this with you. Um, so, next slide, please. First, a brief introduction to Rotterdam. Uh, in this slide, you see the region. Uh, yeah, we brand ourselves as the maritime capital of Europe, which uh, yeah refers to. Um, yeah, the, uh, the the major role that the port and the surrounding areas play in the uh, in the economy of the Netherlands. Rotterdam is the second largest city in the Netherlands, uh, and the port is the largest port of Europe and the largest industry cluster of the Netherlands. And uh, 30, uh, 13 percent of all primary energy consumption in Europe depends on the port of Rotterdam. So that means that if uh, uh, yeah, uh, either through uh, 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 through throughputs of, uh, 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 of, of oil or related products uh, through the port of Rotterdam to either the Netherlands or one of the countries in our hinterlands, they'll, they will have passed through Rotterdam. Um, yeah, this brings a major challenge though. Uh, the economic model of the port is as a result highly dependent on fossil fuels and the port is the largest point source of uh, CO2 emissions in the country. So both for climate reasons and for economic reasons, 
is a business model that we uh, certainly want to change. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, we have essentially three lines uh, in, in terms of policy uh, that we want to, uh, uh, that we, uh, uh, through which we want to pursue uh, uh, hydrogen in the port of Rotterdam. Um, firstly, there's the Roadman Next Economy, which is the regional economic development strategy, the developed in cooperation with the uh, uh, American thinker Jeremy Rifkin. And the goal is to make the Rotterdam the Hague region. Uh, the Hague is uh, very, uh, an, another major city very close to Rotterdam, of course. Uh, economically vibrant and resilient by acting on uh, the big economic transitions that you see in the 21st century. And those include, uh, yeah, uh, smart digital delta, so digitalization, energy transition, circular economy, uh, changes in the way entrepreneurship works and changes in the way uh, people interact with one another in society, a digital society. Um, except uh, furthermore, there's the uh, the energy switch, so the local cl climate action program, which is committed to the Paris Agreement. And uh, the national translation of those goals is that we want to achieve a 49% uh, reduction of CO2 in 2030 compared to 1990, uh, which is the national target. Uh, it may become slightly more ambitious still because the European Commission is now gunning for 55%. Um, and the goal in 2050 is to become climate neutral. And we as Rotterdam want to, yeah, uh, want to play our part in meeting these ambitions. And hydrogen is absolutely a pillar in this, uh, in this strategy. We cannot reach these goals without hydrogen. And finally, the Rotterdam Maritime Capital of Europe, which uh, is uh, looking into uh, the wider economy. We're not just looking at production, uh, transport, and uh, consumption of hydrogen, but also want to ensure that uh, uh, um, uh, the product, products and services required for the hydrogen economy are also available in the Rotterdam area. So think of manufacturing or uh, the, uh, hydrogen trading platforms or making sure that skilled labor is actually there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here you see a brief overview of the energy transition uh, policy for the port and we, which is not just the city of Rotterdam, but a big coalition of companies and regional governmental entities have developed a three-step plan for taking on the energy to the transition. And if you look uh, to the, uh, closely to the, to, into the, the text in steps two and step three, you can see that hydrogen features very heavily there. So both in the medium term and in the long term, hydrogen is essential. We want to use it for supplying industries with uh, low CO2 fuels and feedstocks. And we want to use them for uh, hydrogen for greening the transport chains through the ports. So think of shipping and trucks and in due term, synthetic fuels for aviation as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, and the ultimate goal for that is making sure that this 13% of the primary energy consumption of Europe um, which is now uh, based on fossil fuels, that, uh, that that role of fossil fuels will be taken in by hydrogen. We want to play our part in making the Netherlands and Europe meet our ambitious climate targets. And uh, we want to uh, ensure that the regional economy stays vibrant and becomes even more vibrant. And we think hydrogen is an excellent venue to pursue those two goals. Um, so, therefore, we want to develop the port of Rotterdam and the surrounding region into a major hydrogen hub with large scale production, import, trading, and use of the sustainable fuel and feedstock. And yeah, we want to realize this vision in close cooperation with other industry clusters and, and hydrogen hubs in the Netherlands and the surrounding uh, countries. Because, well, what makes uh, Rotterdam unique, but particularly all of Northwestern Europe, including uh, Throning, as Mr. Dirk just detailed, uh, we have a unique proximity of hydrogen supply uh, and uh, 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 powering that uh, by wind on the North Sea and, and demand in various industrial clusters. Um, we can develop technological uh, innovation and the required uh, policy to facilitate this in cooperation within the Netherlands and with other regions. And uh, yeah, the, uh, and Rotterdam has. The particular assets, uh, for example, our excellent port infrastructure, or the fact that we can uh, produce blue hydrogen in large amounts in a very uh, in comparatively short term, uh, uh, which which is complementary to uh, assets that you would see in other regions. For example, the 
large scale uh, storage and salt caverns that Mr. Kiefer mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have a uh, we're we're developing a portfolio of, uh, of hydrogen projects as well, and yeah, this uh, is is again an overview that changes every three months. There's new projects coming up in uh, all the time it seems, but uh, a couple of the most important ones are shown here. Um, it's good to start with blue hydrogen because uh, this is key to our strategy because we can uh, in in uh, in comparatively short term. We, uh, we hope to have the system operational in 2026, 2027, uh, to actually already be able to uh, uh, locally produce blue hydrogen, so made from natural gas, and then the CO2 is captured and stored uh, in an empty gas field underneath the North, North Sea, CCS. And we want to use that for uh, process heat and industry and, if possible, electricity generation as well. We can really uh, move forward in producing hydrogen and industrial scale like this. Um, green hydrogen is very important as well. Uh, we have several initiatives for large scale electrolysis, which is powered by offshore wind and should be combined in a two gigawatt conversion park uh, at, at the very tip of the port close to the sea. And this is, uh, and, and, and the electrolyzers contained in this conversion park are developed by companies like Shell, and BP and Lorient. Um, we want to create an, uh, a hydrogen backbone for the port, which should allow uh, producers and consumers to connect with one another. And for consumption, we want to use it as a resource for industries to produce uh, 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 decarbonized uh, uh, chemical products, for example. Um, Emission-free shipping. Of several pilots for inland shipping. And in due time, once that works, we will move on to uh, uh, seafaring applications as well. Uh, E-fuels for aviation. Uh, there are some public initiatives in small scale road transport. So, uh, when you're looking at buses or, uh, uh, uh or, 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 or vans that are used by the, by the municipality for, uh, 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 for, uh, for maintenance in the city, uh, those are, uh, will be powered by hydrogen uh, as well. And, uh, uh, there are some housing corporation initiatives which look into small scale pilots for using hydrogen for heating the built environment. Uh, nevertheless, importing hydrogen is necessary because uh, of a lack of regional potential to cost effectively generate enough uh, sustainable energy. And it's not that we don't have a large potential for that. Uh, we can produce quite a lot of blue and green hydrogen. However, if we want to move on to this 13% uh, of Europe, then import will be necessary. And therefore we envision the Rotterdam region as a hydrogen hub as well in due time. Next slide, please. So, and here you can see in three phases how we want to develop it. At first, we're looking at starting this uh, uh, blue and green hydrogen production potential and making sure that uh, the infrastructure is there so that we can get it to consumers as well. Next phase from 30, 2030 onwards, we'll look into further expanding our green hydrogen production and as well developing the first international hydrogen supply chains and connecting to neighboring regions and countries. So, looking at uh, industrial regions in the Netherlands, but Belgium and the rural area in Germany as well. And then finally, in 2050, we hope to have uh, way, uh, uh, a, a very significant growth in the amount of hydrogen that we. Uh, produce and consume. Currently, we produce 400 kilotons. Um, we are already a major producer and consumer of hydrogen, mainly used for oil refining, but then it will be much bigger. Uh, we aim for uh, 20 megatons of clean hydrogen uh, through the port, uh, which is 50 times as much. Um, so that definitely depends on mature, uh, on mature supply chains going in from uh, uh, yeah, from everywhere around the world, either hydrogen produced with solar energy in North Africa or the Middle East, or with wind energy in Scotland, for example, moving that through Rotterdam to our hinterlands and using it as a green in feedstock for industry in both Rotterdam and its hinterlands, and uh, yeah, uh, and, and and also widespread application in mobility. Next slide, please. Um, well, 
uh, a quick look into the local governance. We didn't make these plans just by ourselves and we're not going to execute them by either. This picture shows all the signees of the Rotterdam Climate Agreement, the local climate action plan, which was developed to do our part in executing the Dutch Climate Agreement, which was mentioned by Mr. Feinstra. Um, this shows how plans are developed here. So we have together a wide coalition of companies, both big ones and smaller enterprises, and governmental, governmental entities and state-owned companies like uh, the Port of Rotterdam uh, Authority or grid operators, and academia, NGOs, and citizens are involved as well. And this consensus-based approach ensures that different perspectives are, uh, are heard, which uh, will ultimately lead to a firmer base of societal support. Next slide, please. So, um, wrapping up, uh, our goal is to develop a, a vibrant hydro hydrogen economy in uh, the Rotterdam region, both for economic reasons and for sustainability reasons. And yeah, what are we looking to do that uh, for to do that? Uh, we're looking for new technologies and business models. We want to develop opportunities for production, consumption, and import and trade of hydrogen, focused on the port in particular. And uh, yeah, we're looking for access to networks in that knowledge too. Yeah, uh, so we're very curious to see what's uh, uh, happening concurrently in, 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 in Japan as well in order to uh, yeah, be on top of things, sharpen our roles, local governments, and make uh, validated choices with the uh, scarce resources. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Liwe, for a very in, uh, impressive uh, overview and latest developments in the Rotterdam area. Uh, thank you so much. So this closes the, four, the, the seven presentations that we had. It was quite a lot, quite informative and uh, a lot of information. Thanks again for all the speakers. I'm looking at the dashboard and also uh, we have, uh, uh, there was a, a few questions and comments. And uh, if you allow me, I would like to give uh, each of the presenter uh, one uh, question. And if you are me, I would start with the first uh, presenter, Mr. Han Feinstra from the Ministry of Economic Affairs in the Netherlands. And um, so the question is, um, your, your ministry combines economy and environment. So it's the combi combination of the Japanese MITI and the Ministry of Environment together. And uh, right within this energy transition and hydrogen dialogue, this is uh, very important to combine these, uh, these two. And also, you, as you said, the hydrogen policy is based on the, on the climate policy. So there is already this combination. But this combination is quite unique in the world. I think uh, there's not so many countries. And also in Japan, you have, we see two ministries. And my question, or our question, which is also from the group, is uh, how, how did those two come together? And what kind of advantages do you see by combining uh, these two ministries into one integrated policy? Thank you, uh, Rob. Yeah, interesting question. Um, of course, this was decided by the by the, the government uh, a number of years ago to uh, to make sure that there will be one integrated policy for for climate and for energy. I think because we very much realize that uh, uh, climate policy is energy policy, and energy energy policy is climate policy. I mean, they should have the same goals and this is something that our uh, government did uh, very much realized when they started uh, uh, well when, when the cabinet started uh, three years ago and the big advantage is indeed that we uh, um, that we make sure that the policy are aligned and uh, uh, and that the, the climate goals I mean they are uh, the ones that are leading, eh? so energy policy is part of climate policy uh, uh, because we very much realize the importance of uh, acting uh, quickly and, uh, and make sure that we are are uh, uh, reaching our climate goals. Um, and in order to make sure that uh, uh, that we don't lose too much time. Uh, in, in, in finding out what is the right strategy and, and we made sure it was part of one, one uh, 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 ministry. But of course, we are still also working together with other ministries 
uh, uh, for infrastructure, for foreign affairs, etc. Uh, because of course, uh, uh, it, the, the 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 policy field is much broader than only this ministry. So we still, it's not 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 like everything is really concentrated in one ministry. It's still a, a joint effort of all the ministries in the Netherlands. Uh, Thank you. That's very interesting. And indeed, you will never be completely integrated because then you would only end up with one ministry, of course, and that would be too much. But um, this already helps, I think. Uh, thank you. I go to, uh, I, I, I wish I could ans ask a second question to Mitty, but I, I just was informed that I uh, had to uh, step out of our session because of other uh, duties. So excuse me that we cannot ask that question. Um, so the third question to uh, your Giefler from TKI New Gas. Um, you have been making advices to the government in the Netherlands and, and also making these uh, uh, impressive overviews of activities. So um, could you explain a little bit about the main uh, the international components of those advices and, and then maybe again, but you already did, maybe focus a little bit on the role of Japan in this respect. Um, I think, as I said in my presentation, um, international co collaboration is really key for the success of hydrogen because the challenge that we face is just too enormous. We have to share, let's say, all our efforts to make this a success. And the Netherlands is, is very much looking at international collaboration. And um, I was just thinking, you know, if there's one topic that we really share from both sides, like there's a lot around mobility, about industry. I think industry is a very important one, but if I have to mention one topic that's really interesting for international cooperation, I think it's about import. And um, I was thinking about um, maybe we should have a sort of international uh, trade coalition or an international trade uh, program around hydrogen where we learn how to deal with imports. Like it's not just doing one project after the other, but it's more about an integrated plan and maybe Japan and the Netherlands could take the lead in that because we both very much will depend on imports, uh, maybe also exports, but given uh, the huge energy intensity of both, our, uh, of both our countries on one hand and on the limited production potential, well, you know, it's there, but it will always be limited so I think that this is really important that we have a look at that, not only on the technical side, so how do we deal with infrastructure, how do we deal with shipping, with storage, but also, um, um, let's say, uh, the economics of the site, the certification, um, safety issues. So there's so much around imports. And although it may take another five to 10 years before this will develop on a really large scale, I think we have to take it on now to make sure that we're ready for this. And I think with all these parties in this workshop, like the last one, the Port of Rotterdam, it's a very important player, the Northern Netherlands, but also on the Japanese side, I think there lies a huge opportunity here to make that a success. So that would be my um, suggestion. Thank you. That's uh, indeed very important. Uh, also geopolitically, this whole trade issue is, uh, one of the main drivers of uh, of the future in this uh, area. Thank you, uh, Jor. The next uh, question to Mr. Otani. You have been. Uh, thank you for your uh, overview of the of the projects that you gave, and they are on on this on the mainly on the green uh, hydrogen, so the uh, the Suiso Saise Energy in Japanese, and. The question is, are you happy with the speed in which we are working on this green hydrogen? Are we fast enough? Are we, are you happy with this speed? If you can say something about that, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, 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 so, so yeah, I, I, uh, if you want, you can say it in Japanese, and I will translate it. No problem. No problem. あ、日本語でいいですか。あの、えっと、本当にありがとうございます。えっと、そのまあ、グリーンスイスを
Thank you very much. I will quickly translate it. So the green hydrogen projects to implement them. What is mostly needed is this uh, the technological developments that you need. So to develop technologies that speed this up. And I think the answer that you maybe want to give is in that sense that uh, it, uh, the speed is dependent on on this technological uh, development. So, yes, so no. This is thing I need to do this. Speed up. Ah, maybe not. So, so, hi. Thank you very much. So, uh, investment in technological development is a key uh, in 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 speeding up the the implementation of green hydrogen. Thank you very much. I have a question here for also for uh, uh, Mr. Paul de Rook of the City of Groningen. So um, again, uh, con congratulations with uh, with the predicate of the Hydrogen Valley uh, Europe that was awarded uh, to the region. And the question is, uh, how how do you work together with the national government in the Netherlands to make this uh, regional uh, project into a success and ensure that uh, there is a substantial contribution in the Netherlands? Uh, this uh, in, uh, in in the Netherlands dialogue in, in this respect. Could you say something about that, please? Sure. Um, well, I think part of the answer is, is is what you all could have seen that the regional strategy that we have for the Northern Netherlands is mostly aligned to the strategy that the national government has. Uh, if you saw Mr. Feinstra's presentation, uh, most of these ambitions are quite uh, are quite linked. Um, uh, and I think some, something other I, 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 I could mention is that, of course, we tend to be as regions sometimes a little bit more ambitious than our national governments, which is understandable because they, I think they have to balance more interest altogether. Uh, but we also see it as our part to push forward for our agenda uh, more on the national level, but also on the on the European level. So I think we're quite closely working together um, and we see it as our role to uh, push our national governments uh, to make more haste, more uh, to give more speed in uh, uh, developing uh, the agenda even further. Thank you very much. Um, very good to hear, very encouraging. The next question for Mr. Majima. As a city, you, are, uh, um, uh, you have a very important role, you, as you said, um, as a city, but also as a harbor. And if you zoom in to, into this port area, uh, the question is, are you uh, developing relations with foreign municipalities in this respect? Are you uh, proactively making links with cities in foreign countries that have a harbor and, and have uh, ambitions in the, in the hydrogen area? じゃあ、すみません、日本語でいいですか。あ、はい。あの、ポートの、あの、コースタルエリアっていうことで、ま、あの、川崎市としてあの、海外のあの、シート協力を展開されてますかというポートのオペレーションハンドリングなんかを協力し合ってます。そういうことを将来水素を輸入したとき、に役立てていこうというところで、今あの私どもの公安局ポートオーソリティと一緒に取り組んでいるところです。ありがとうございます。So I will translate quickly. Um, so the uh, Kawasaki, the city of Kawasaki, does have uh, relations with uh, different foreign cities, including in Vietnamese and uh, and in the U.S. And, and also in other countries. And these are uh, mainly in port and trade uh, relations. And uh, the, amb the ambition is also to use those uh, existing relations to uh, develop uh, the, uh, in, the, in the terms of hydrogen as well. So this is in the beginning phase, I, is my interpretation. And uh, I hope that today's uh, session also helps in finding each other and understanding each other's city's uh, ambitions a bit further. And that get that maybe help uh, also in that relation. Thank you so much, Majima San. And the last question to uh, Mr. Brouwer of Rotterdam City. Um, I, I remember last year we had a, a delegation to Japan, and you joined that one, and we also visited uh, Kawasaki City. So I, I, I um, uh, Rotterdam as Kawasaki has a has a large uh, port role, and uh, you have been talking about that. And I'm just wondering what. Resemblance, resemblances do you see between uh, your cities, so the city of Rotterdam and the city of Kawasaki? Do you have any 
overlap and would you have any interest in, in, in furthering uh, those relations? If you can elaborate a little bit on that, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the similarity is quite quite large indeed. Um, yeah, uh, be, uh, it, uh, because not only do we both have ports, but if I uh, but if I remember correctly, Kawasaki has a significant petrochemical industrial cluster as well, um, and, and 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 both of these and, and both the logistics side of the port as, as well as the industrial side of the port, they both face the same challenge of uh, of the energy transition and hydrogen as a possible solution for that. So uh, yeah, the, the 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 parallels are very clear. Um, yeah, the yeah and. Uh, uh, looking into at least exchange of knowledge and and, and, and projects that seems very uh, worth uh, that, 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 that seems very worthwhile as well. Thank you. So I uh, I hope that uh, today's discussion was also insightful uh, and, and helps in building the relations. Thank you for uh, all your uh, answers and. Uh, um, I have, I had actually one more question is coming in maybe for Han. Are you still there? If Han Finstra, if you, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, just a, a short, short question. During the Ham, uh, Minister Wiebes uh, gave uh, a video, uh, video speech, and in which he uh, highlighted the importance of innovation of financial support uh, schemes to invest in, uh, in this hydrogen development and what role of government and, and public-private partnerships do you deem uh, necessary in this respect? There was a question coming in, if you could shortly react to that, if possible. It is about the financial instruments that are needed currently. Correct. And subsidies, well, subsidies yes. schemes or, or public-private partnership schemes? Well, talking about the, the subsidy schemes, I mean, uh, people in the Netherlands know that this is uh, right now uh, quite uh, uh, an issue in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, because what you actually find out is that the subsidy schemes that were existing do not completely fit the specifics of uh, hydrogen projects. So that's why we announced a uh, new uh, subsidy instruments, and we are developing these right now. Um, this is also part of a discussion within the EU. I mean, how to uh, uh, to deal with also the EU state aid uh, issues, and what kind that we need more flexibility uh, flexibility uh, to find the right uh, instruments. So this is something that actually. Uh, uh, is uh, something that governments, not only in the Netherlands, but also in other European countries are working on. At the same time, I think we also are still in the progress or in the, yeah, in the phase of understanding what hydrogen projects are about. Uh, and uh, um, so we very much appreciate also to understand from companies what they are learning, what is uh, required to for uh, a, a 20 megawatt or a 50 megawatt electrolyzer uh, a project uh, because these are clearly all things that have not been done before and i think uh, both governments and and uh, knowledge institutions and companies are learning uh, what is uh, what it actually means to work on cost reduction and scaling up uh, both from a, uh, a technology uh, perspective but also financial perspective uh, of course, we also need to involve financial institutions, banks, uh, investment funds, and because uh, a government cannot do this uh, uh, alone, and it needs to be a shared uh, effort. Thank you. I think uh, that's uh, actually a great uh, a bridge, so to say, to uh, what I wanted to say in my closing uh, remarks, because indeed we are in a transition, and that means that we are still not there and uh, we uh, learn by doing and do by learning and uh, uh, and that's why we do this these uh, these webinars and and meeting each other and learning from each other and um, thanks Han for that reaction 
And 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 for my so as a closing, I'm first of all I am I'm really honored and proud to be uh, here with uh, really uh, first class speakers and, and and presenters that share with us uh, their knowledge and experience and also the requirements and what we need to do. I mean these these we, together we have to make these steps. And why uh, are we both Netherlands and Japan front runners? Is because I think I, I have a few takeaways. And I think we both have this urgency uh, in uh, in changing our our energy mix in the in the Netherlands and natural gas. Of course, in Japan we have uh, an impact from the nuclear uh, uh, in, uh, disaster in 2011 that all speed up um, actually uh, 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 transitions that we had to do already uh, in the first place. We are closely we are coming closer together. The Netherlands is also stepping up in electrification. We both have a strong knowledge base, and we both see uh, opportunities uh, over the whole value chain from supply to use. And um, we both see that it's uh, essential to make a, a hydrogen substantial and sustainable part of the energy transition. But it's not only energy, we also should also contribute to economy and environment as well. So this is a holistic approach and that we are talking about. And um, there, I think what I take away from today is that uh, the Netherlands and Japan can help each other a lot in, in connecting and connecting in various levels. I wrote down a few key words. The first thing we need to connect is long-term goals with short-term actions. We talked, both countries have 2050 on the map. And, and, and uh, as we speak, uh, are implementing uh, strategies and programs. Uh, connection between uh, policies for, on the one hand, supply, and the one hand, the other hand, uh, use. The first one is more on industry. The second one is more on, on, on products and uh, et cetera. And in that respect, how, can, uh, how to connect national uh, governments and local governments? I mean, there is different, as we heard, one is more, maybe you can say ambitious, but it's maybe also more concrete on a local level, which is logical, and there is more abstract uh, in, in national level, but how to connect those two in, uh, in an efficient way, that's not easy to do, and uh, therefore we can help each other in that sense. I think uh, how to connect public and private, as Han already said in the last uh, reaction, and it's not only to connect public and private, but it's also how can our bilateral relations help companies that want to collaborate, help their environment in which that collaboration has to be successful. Only helping two companies without an environment will not easily lead to success. So what kind of a larger area and larger environment and, and dialogues are necessary that not only stimulates, but also enables uh, collaboration to be fruitful and successful. Another connection is to, make, to be made by, between innovation and business. We need to, yeah, when can you make a step over? We're not talking about chicken and eggs, but sometimes we are, of course. Um, then we have, uh, I think also our both countries, as we are leaders in this area, we are also partners for this dialogue. So bringing this dialogue further, bringing this dialogue broader and deeper. Those are all things that we can help each other. And last but not least, how can solutions be accepted in society? There is how to, to connect so solutions and society. So there's a lot of connections to be made and um, the, the, the overall connections we are trying to make in this uh, event and in these weeks are, of course, the relations between uh, Japan and the Netherlands on all these aspects that we have heard. And with that said, I think we have a, a really a tumbler of, of activities and levels and, and, and knowledge and uh, uh, people to, to connect to. And uh, with that said, I I'm, again, I want to thank very much our presenters. And also, I want to thank uh, our listeners, and I hope it has been a learning experience for all, as same as it was for me. And uh, uh, further in this week, we still have a few uh, activities. Please uh, try to uh, register, and if you have any trouble, uh, contact us directly uh, if for, for any assistance. So with having said that, um, I would like to close this uh, very uh, interesting session. 
and thank you all again very much. Thank you so much. Ariato, was I much done? Thank you.